Now, James, I was interested in uh, your perspective on J.P. Morgan's silver position on the comics, because you've recently written an article about this, and you say that it's at a record high level compared to really anyone else who has had a silver position in recent history. They have 133 million ounces, and your argument is they're probably owning the bullion for preservation and speculation. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, I, I just finished writing an article and got published on valuewalk.com today. And it is pertaining to, you know, the largest modern day silver positions ever held that, you know, you can find based on fact and figures. And uh, if you go back to the 1970s, 1980 bull run, obviously there's that scapegoating of the Hunt brothers saying that they cornered the uh, silver market. Uh, when they had about 100 billion ounces of silver uh, in physical form versus another over 100 million ounces of derivative form silver that was traded on the comics. The comics changed the rules in January as silver was hitting $50 an ounce, and those rule changes um, prohibitively hit the Hunt brothers and anyone else who was long on the silver comics, and uh, they lost billions and had to be bailed out by the Federal, Federal Reserve and I don't know, a consortium of 20 some, 21 banks, I believe, to a tune of about a billion dollars. Uh, years later, they were tried in court and, and fined hundreds of millions of dollars and, and scapegoated for decades to follow. So that was the first major position, which was essentially 100 billion ounces of silver in 1980. Uh, the next major position of silver that's historical was the 129.7 million ounce position that was taken by Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and Berkshire Hathaway. That started in 1998, and it continued to 2006 when they sold it. Uh, I believe they may have doubled in price as far as you know their actual investment. Silver, I believe, went up about twofold in that time frame, uh, and that position was sold off to likely begin the uh, ETF of uh, the most popular silver ETF called uh, SLV that I'm sure most listeners are aware of. Um, so that was 129.7 million ounces, but um, recently J.P. Morgan broke through that level. Uh, let's see, it was probably this past summer that they got through that level. And um, this past week, there's just been a heavy amount of silver, millions of ounces going into their comics depository. I think the total now is, like you said, 130. it's over 133 million ounces. And it's not to say that J.P. Morgan outright owns all that. But they certainly own a lot of silver that's outside of that because they're constantly withdrawing silver bullion out of the SLV because they are not only an authorized participant, one of only a few, which means that they can they can swap uh, SLV equity shares for silver bullion. Um, but they're also the custodian of the thing, right? So they literally are in charge of the 300 million ounces of silver that sits in in the vaults in London that they that they look over. So uh, it's essentially like the fox looking over the hen house uh, situation. And the question, I guess, just comes to mind. It's like the, the timing of it all. Like it started, they started with nothing, with no silver bullion in April of 2011, as the price of silver was hitting 50 bucks an ounce. You had crazy things going on, like Max Kaiser running around the internet saying, buy silver, crash JP Morgan. I mean, it was broadcasted on Russia Today. And it was, it was essentially, it was pretty crazy what was going on in the market. And uh, it's not that you would have to be a fool to think that they didn't see all this going on and didn't potentially learn from it. My, my contention is essentially they've, they've been acquiring silver this entire time that they've likely helped to keep the, pr the price, you know, uh, suppressed because they are the largest, most concentrated short on it. Uh, so they've likely been making a lot of money trading it short. Um, and then at some point when, you know, the price starts to go up, because inevitably it will have to, uh, my assumption is that ultimately we're headed toward a debasing dollar in the future because of just all the unfunded liabilities and the debt overhangs. So essentially, J.P. Morgan's getting both. They're getting, they're getting to make money on the down uh, over these last seven years. And in the future, when, when we start having revaluations of commodities, they will likely make uh, a lot of money in the future based on their silver position. And likely as well, it's 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 also it's also I think an attempt to preserve themselves because they are you know they probably flagrantly overtraded their entire value and if they have a bad bet here or there, uh, they'll at least have some physical bullion to hopefully make up for some of those lost bets. 
That's a really great now, summary, Eric. If you could jump in here, why do you think that silver? Uh, why do you think that J.P. Morgan has such a large silver position? Yeah, that that's a great summary, and um, clearly, you know, the administering the SLV and the requirements associated with that is something that enables J.P. Morgan to see a huge amount of the marketplace in silver lit up, seeing all of the players, understanding the book that comes for SLV, understanding what's going on in both the LBMA and the COMEX uh, as a major bullion dealer and, excuse me, not bullion dealer, but a bullion bank, you know, as one of the primary bullion banks. We know that silver is massively manipulated. We can see the very big picture when it comes to, for example, what goes on with the cot wash, rinse, repeat cycle that we have reported on ad nauseum for years at Silver Doctors. It's not in question anymore. Uh, we have the regulators busting Deutsche Bank and other banks, bullion banks, for being involved with um, spoofing orders and manipulating the markets that way. Uh, the revelations that came out of that court case didn't go deep enough, as I warned literally on the very day that JP, excuse me, the Deutsche Bank was was being reported for being under investigation. We, Doc and I, did a show on that, warning that that wasn't going to go very far, and it hasn't. What JP Morgan has been able to do is hide how they manage the silver market, and part of how they do this is not something that I can prove. But when you own major or control major portions of a market, you're able to understand that market. And controlling the warehouse inventory for SLV combined with this 100-plus million-ounce position, you know, they, they have a lot of power, and they move their inventory around within a short period window that escapes reporting requirements, and this is how they manage the market. I a while back, Blythe Masters was on CNBC when she was still working for J.P. Morgan as their commodities head honcho, and she was asked point blank, what's the story with J.P. Morgan's rising and large inventory position? And she just poo-pooed it as saying, well, we own a lot of silver for clients. Clearly, that's not what only is motivating J.P. Morgan. Uh, I, I agree with the thesis about them seeking to have a hedge against the downside market action that's coming, and that's part of what they're doing. But I think their primary motivation, ever since Bear Stearns and their role went up in smoke when Bear Stearns died, uh, and J.P. Morgan rose to take on a much bigger position within the silver market, I, I think they just have become the primary bullion steward of the manipulation of silver. And it's... At some point, this kind of information will will seep out, and people will be able to prove it. I hope. Yeah, the difficulty in all this is um, obviously this is a lot of speculation, and the, the most difficult thing is to trade on that and to hope that it's correct. Because inevitably, when the answer is right, if it is right, um, it'll be too late probably then to to act. You know, you're talking about a situation where where prices are going up, you know, vertically. And then you're talking about paying through the eye for premiums on any silver bullion you can acquire at the time, right? So that's that's the, the ultimate difficulty of the whole situation. Right, and right now, if the manipulation is something that's really going on, really the low prices are really a gift right now, right? And no doubt, if you're someone who believes in uh, silver and you want to go long silver and you have a long-term time frame, you know, something to the 2020s, I, I believe, it would make total sense. Not just silver, but also gold, too, or platinum and palladium, potentially. But, I mean, it's it's proven. If you backtest um, stock, stocks and equities um, in the United States versus um, bonds and versus bullion, if you backtest it from 1968 to now or to 2016, uh, you know, you should have you should have had roughly a 25 percent allocation to gold and silver, and and that that back testing essentially doesn't take into account uh, you know any type of dividends or anything like that. So keep that in mind. The study doesn't take into account real estate or anything like that. It just the study that I'm citing is simply bonds versus equities versus bullion, and it it in the long term, especially under a fiat currency regime, 
it totally makes sense to have an allocation of bullion um, at all times. All the more so after such a long period of uh, depressed surprise prices and, and trading. I mean, we're we're living in a world where the cost of production and the decline in production going forward is going to guarantee higher prices, regardless of what the cartel does. They're going to have to back off. They, they Otherwise, they will risk breaking the system of manipulation that they control. Physical will make that happen. Now, moving on here to this week's action in the precious metal markets, we saw gold go to about 1350, which I know is a very key level for gold. What is your perspective, Eric, on the technical analysis side of what we saw in the gold and silver markets this week? Well, frankly, the technical stuff really isn't all that interesting um, in this particular shorter window, other than the fact that we bounced on areas that didn't, you know, surprise all that much. Uh, uh, silver not breaching 16, gold, you know, holding roughly 13 and change. The dollar finding some support at 88. Uh, all of these, uh, you know, the bond market uh, having reactions when the 10-year was threatening to take out, um, you know, or excuse me, the 30-year threatening to take out 3%, and the shift in expectations on a going forward basis and what all that means. All of these kind of things confluence in the last two weeks to, in my mind, paint a really interesting picture about where people's sentiment and psychology have changed when it comes to a number of markets and how that relates to gold and silver is key. Um, we've lived in a world where since the 2008 crash, the bond vigilantes have gone on vacation uh, on the assumption that central bankers were dead serious on saving the system, and they were. It was the right call. Volatility went to almost nothing. Uh, we had 500-year lows in interest rates, and everything just was skewed to the point of ridiculousness when it came to how far people were on one side of the boat when it comes to psychology. What was interesting in the last two weeks when we saw this market correction is that we've been seeing the dollar go down while interest rates were going up. Generally speaking, in economics, people make the assumption that interest rates going up are going to attract more interest in bond buyers because bond buyers would say if they borrow Japanese yen to purchase U.S. treasuries, uh, translating that into dollars, they would make even more profit if the dollar was going up over a two-month holding period. Hot money moves. It doesn't care about 10, 30-year, whatever, duration holding periods when it comes to bonds. It's just looking for hot moves that can capture a couple percentage moves you know, in short-term profit. What we saw in the last two weeks is fascinating. We saw the dollar falling, interest rates going up, and stocks going down. It's you know, a complete flight to safety and, and abdication of even the idea that you know, the stock market would be going up in the future on account of stronger economics and higher dollar, bringing more interest into U.S. dollar-denominated assets. We're also seeing, you know, a couple of weeks back, the Chinese let out a story that could conceivably be a trial balloon when it came to how they're managing their um, accounts for FX and their uh, foreign exchange reserves in the U.S. dollar and how they talked about possibly not being interested. There was a Bloomberg report in particular that came out talking about how China was interested in lessening its holdings of U.S. treasuries. It really does look like there's a reawakening of the bond vigilante community and a lot more skepticism when it comes to the long-term trend of U.S. Treasuries and the general paradigm when it comes to interest rates. Interest rates going up with a dollar going down is an interesting signal. I think people are waking up to the reality that the stock market is massively extended and overvalued and interest rates are going to go up no matter what the Fed and other central bankers do, even though they'll be protesting periodically and backpedaling on all of their claims about balance sheet normalization and you know quantitative tightening and stuff so short term the move that we've seen is really fast snap um, back in, in precious metals is telling uh, I think we did see a tiny bit of liquidity drawdown you know when margins calls come in it wasn't just 100% manipulation although that was definitely there 
Um, even Bitcoin's decline and the cryptocurrency's decline was partially linked to people needing to rush to get some liquidity. Uh, but now that the dust has settled, the dollar right now is up. Uh, if I'm looking at the live real-time quote for the March 18th dollar uh, DXY futures, and that's up 0.5967% right now. Um, so, you know, the, the markets went through a two-year, excuse me, two, two-week freakout. And I think that the sentiment has now finally shifted around, and people are a lot more skeptical, and that's a good thing. But we'll probably stabilize in the general equity market. The central bankers put in a lot of liquidity, and we'll see footsteps of that as time goes on in the next week or so. We'll be able to see more of that kind of data. And we'll go back to sleep for a couple of months, <laughs> and, and maybe equities will go up, and we'll see the S&P 500 try to take out 3,000. Um, I don't think that this was the, the – the, it was just a shot across the bow when it came to people waking up to the realization that there's real risk in the markets, and this volatility trade in particular blowing up is what woke a lot of people up, that combined with what's going on on the interest rate paradigm. So long term, this year and further out, I, I think we're going to see a lot higher prices in precious metals as markets revert to the mean. Interest rates going up, stock market going down, metals going up. Yeah, and just real quick on to follow up on the DXY on the U.S. dollar index. If you look technically at the chart, um, as far as you know how it's performed, especially in the last major bear market from 2002 down to 2005. Um, it looks like this one is essentially the same type of angle and, and, you know, calling for something like a U.S. dollar low hitting around 2020. So I, it definitely calls for higher bullion prices in the next few years, just on, based on the fact that the dollar is going to be losing value versus other currencies, most likely. Definitely. And what is your perspective, James, on the – uh, bonds, the interest rate rising, but then also the dollar falling, and it it doesn't normally work that way, as Eric was saying. Yeah, I, it um, for for a while there, I even now to this day, I still feel like at some point, rising interest rates are going to cause a major problem, and at that point, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve. I'm, that's my hunch is that they, this is the reason why they've been trying to raise rates and talking about raising it four times this year. They need to have some type of uh, clearance for when the market does finally go into recession. They have you know some some room to start cutting rates. And my belief is we're heading into a situation in the 2020s where we're going to see even further lower rates than we saw last time. We're probably going toward a situation where they may even do negative interest rates here. Um, it's going to be a kind of a twilight zone, negative interest rate world where we're going to have essentially rates lower than last and we're going to have a stagflation economy where they lie about what's going on with, uh, with inflation and they, kind of, they keep rigging the, the inflation statistics and essentially we have a huge gap between uh, real rates and uh, what's going on in, in the real world as far as prices. It's basically keep them confused, and and we're just going to keep debasing the dollar, and uh, have a five or ten percent gap, and run that for a decade, and then we'll get out from under hopefully the uh, unfunded liabilities and the massive debt that we've accumulated. That's essentially the longer term vision of where I think this goes. Yeah, and let me build on that a little bit just to help people understand. Uh, when it comes to dollar moves, the FX market is huge. It's over $5 trillion in notional value flying around in any given trading day. What happens is people will go to Japan, borrow yen, buy U.S. dollars to purchase U.S. dollar-denominated assets. And what we've seen in the last two weeks has been a shift in some of that. And it tells us about where global expectations are when it comes to the United, <clears throat> to the United States equity and bond markets. That was the telling signal from the last two weeks. It's the take-home message that the market was sending. Now, moving back to the precious metal markets, we saw, I guess, good news for gold and silver this week. Another state, some states have done this before, another state, Idaho, uh, said basically no more taxes on gains or losses from selling precious metals. So I guess starting with James, what does this mean for the gold and silver markets? 
Yeah, every every state that comes out and does this, it's it's positive. I mean, there's people who believe in states' rights over uh, over trading for precious metals, and this is just confirmation in another state, uh, you know, validating that point. Of course, anyone in Idaho who would you know bought gold or silver and then later sells it for fiat currency would would certainly have capital gains taxes to pay to the federal government, because the federal government has yet to validate our point here that uh, constitutional money shouldn't be taxed. But, uh, you know, if as the trend of each state falling down like this keeps occurring, who knows, maybe at some point down the line in our lives, the federal government will come around. But uh, I, I'm not very, um, I'm not optimistic that that's going to happen anytime soon. We'll probably have gray hair by the time that happens. But uh but um, but it is validation in the sense that there are a lot of state legislatures who who believe in uh, in sound money and who believe in constitutional money. So uh, and it's another good point as to why people should uh, not just simply buy private mint bullion products because it, I like the optionality sometimes of having legal tender um, currency legal tender rights on say an American silver eagle and a, an American gold eagle because you literally can use those in private sale contracts, and they're enforceable in a court of law. I mean, if you had, for instance, Elijah, if I was going to buy something from you, like a used car, I could, I could, we could draw up a contract that could explicitly state I'm going to, you know, pay you X amount of American Silver Eagle 0.99 silver coins. And uh, if I didn't come with the payment, you could show up in court and say, uh, you know, he owes me that payment. And it would totally be court enforceable if it was signed by an actuary. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot of legal ease, but who knows where it goes in the future with gold and silver prices and values. And just having that option of being able to use them to buy, buy things directly is, uh, you know, it's somewhat appealing. Yeah, it's a great development, and there's been a number of states that are jumping on this bandwagon. Even Oregon is looking at it where I live. Um, it'll be a number of years before they get anywhere in the state legislature, but I've I've talked to state senators and representatives in Oregon about this as well, too, and Ron Paul has been um, talking to people as well in other states. And this, this movement is alive and well, and it'll grow. It'll be wonderful to see how, over the course of the next five to ten years, what happens when it comes to cryptocurrency, blockchain-powered currencies that link up to stores of value, warehoused gold, and whether or not we see a state doing interesting things when it comes to local currencies. There have, in fact, been discussions at the state level throughout the decades of launching local currencies and there are tiny examples of local currencies up and running who knows maybe we might actually see some innovation after some kind of a financial crash it would be wonderful to see these kind of things and i'm openly speaking about this in part just to cast this out as broadcast on the waters and for people to think about it because i'd like to see politicians and activists and people within the cryptocurrency community etc think in these terms and and begin to see some kind of political pressure percolate over the course of the next decade to see this kind of evolution. If we see that, that'll be a wonderful thing. And one point on that, it always goes back toward legal tender laws, right? And the state yeah. wants the right always. It's their prerogative. They, they feel like it's their born prerogative to be able to issue the currency and mandate everyone to pay them in taxes with that currency. And any competing currency has to pay capital gains, right? Cool. Whereas I think humanity, maybe in the next 5, 10, 20 years, is going to get conscious enough to realize that that's a scam and that's how they get hoodwinked, you know, hundreds, every, every, every day, every hour, every moment they're working, they're getting hoodwinked with that scam. So the separation of, of state and, uh, is, and money issuing power is something that is, 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 a, is, a real, is a real important issue that people need to start learning about. Yeah, and uh, I'm reminded of the example of North Dakota and how they have their own state-owned bank system with a bank that you know, benefits from the float and holding of the assets of uh, retirement funds for the state and things like that. I can easily see an, uh, an evolution over the next 10 years after our next financial crash, and we're going to have one. <laughs> it's a question of when, not if. That shakes things up. That bank in North Dakota was born after the Great Depression in response to farmers losing their farms and 
the depressionary impact of what happened to our monetary system. Things change massively when we have huge crashes like what is coming and the confluence of technological developments and what's going on when it comes to perhaps gold becoming part of the currency system in our future in response to you know, the regulators and policymakers scrambling to try to fix the messes that they always make might be the silver lining, forgive the pun, for what may be in our future when it comes to these little incremental moves at a state level. This, this news from Idaho fits into that overall trend when it comes to individual state sovereign entities. <laughs> in our const- so-called constitutional system as watered down as it is, <laughs> and how they relate to the bio myth in Washington and its money-making or, or currency-making debt-creating power. All right. Well, Eric Dubin and James Anderson, Anderson, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had? And James, I know that you have a um, new uh, guide to gold and silver that you have uh, published for any Silver Doctors viewers um, on the website. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, uh, we just created a, it's an over 200 page PDF on uh, you know the 21st century gold rush, and it's chock full of practical insights and information that's uh, you know pretty up to date. I, I, I just completed it, uh, I think in January of this year. So uh, a lot of the content in there is fresh and up to date, and it has real practical things that you can use in the real world, like you know in, intelligent ways to not just buy gold and silver to vet any dealer that you're potentially going to do business with, especially online dealers, how you can find organic reviews versus versus uh, the fake uh, rigged review sites that a lot of the companies use, uh, as well as how to ship and sell gold and silver intelligently. So it, the URL to find the book is sdbullion.com forward slash book. And that's how you can find it. And it's totally free. It's just an email address to get.